Einek, Einek, Einek. Nigeria's election umpire has been accused of being captured by the elite, corrupt in its ranks, inefficient in his ability to ensure credible elections, poor capacity, failing technology, partisan resident electoral commissioners. The list of accusations go on and on. The weekend gave INEC another opportunity to prove it is worth its salt, conducting by and rerun elections in 80 local government areas across 26 states of the Federation. As the results pour in, voter apathy, corruption and violence were recorded again, and elections in three states had to be postponed. My guest on the program today monitored the elections across the country, and together we will attempt to find out just how much salt INEC is worth. Hello and welcome to Political Paradigm on Channels Television. I am Kayla Magwa. My guest on the program is Mr. Samson Itodo, Executive Director of Yaga Africa and convener of the Not Too Young to Run movement. With a background in law and postgraduate degrees in law and public policy, Samson Itodo provides strategic policy advice to parliamentary committees, electoral commissions, political parties, civil society organizations, and academic institutions. In 2018, he was appointed by the Gates Foundation as a goalkeeper and honored by the National Democratic Institute, Washington, D.C., as a 2018 Rising Democracy Leader in Africa. He is the winner of the Future Africa Award Young Person of the Year 2018 and the Leadership Newspaper 2018 Outstanding Young Person of the Year Award. He was also inducted into the 100 Most Influential Young Africans by the African Youth Awards in 2017 and is on more boards than we have time to mention today on the program. Mr. Samson Itodo, welcome to Political Paradigm. Thanks for having me. I want to start off with the elections. I mean, there's so many things going on in the country right now, but just so we can get from Yaga Africa's view, the, the rerun and by-elections in the country that, held, that just held, mm. what, was, what was the... What was the word, the final word from Yaga on the conduct on those elections? I think the final word is it's a mixed bag. Um, there were successes, there were challenges, and there were failures on, on the part of different institutions. The one that's quite profound is the level of turnout for these elections. Um, it was abysmally low, just like we projected, because prior to the elections, in our pre-election statement, we did project that turnout was going to be low for a myriad of reasons. Um, we also saw you know, a situation where um, in certain places, at least in 90% of the locations where, where election held, they were successful, um, even though people didn't show up. Because we saw INEC officials present in um, those locations and waiting for the voters, but the voters didn't show up. And so to that extent, we would say, yes, it was largely successful. However, there are some challenges, and these challenges are not new. They are recurring, and so it puts to question the commitment of the political class you know, to reforming our electoral process, but also the role that different institutions play in the electoral process. There were some logistical challenges, like we saw in, in states like Plateau. We saw cases where thugs, you know, disrupted um, the elections. And so if you look at Enugu, what happened due to the disruption? We also saw cases in Akwaibom as well, where, you know, thugs, you know, also, and hoodlums disrupted um, elections. We saw Kano. Kano was just a total disappointment, especially in Kunchi um, local government, where politicians deployed thugs to disrupt elections. In fact, what was even more brazen was the fact that there were party agents who stole election materials and had the guts and the effrontery to conduct elections and getting people to actually vote. Like a thug? A, 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 poli a party so agent. Thugs would after be the stealing, ones to, after, stealing yes the materials, the yeah. ballot papers and the results. They now conduct their own and election. Yes, to conduct the election. This happened in Kunchi local government. But that's why INEC actually cancelled the election in those in locations. Kano, and Akwaibom and, and Enugu. Enugu. We saw the commission's response, you know, to these um, issues, um, which again 
Yes, the Commission relied on the provisions of the Electoral Act and in Section 24. So we saw a more responsive Electoral Commission in this last election. But this election has actually reinforced the fact that our political class, our politicians, are the biggest problems that we have in our electoral process, especially those ones that come to politics with a do-or-die and zero-sum approach towards the election. Because this is a by-election, very important. Rerun elections, very important. But what will push a political party to mobilize the amount of thugs that they mobilized in Kano to disrupt the election to the extent that party agents can have the guts to steal election materials and attempt to conduct the election. It says a lot about the paradigm of our political actors. And we, we cannot ignore the fact that we need to have a conversation about whether our politicians want to practice democracy or they want a different system of government. Because if it's a democracy, the only way you can secure political power is through competitive politics, is through campaigning and getting people out to vote for you. But more importantly, also respecting the institution. Because this level of impunity that we saw in the by elections and rerun election reinforces the fact that one of the challenges that we have to deal with in any reform process is how to tackle electoral impunity. I want to talk about that for a little bit uh, when it comes to the conduct of elections. We've had people who say, well, political, the political class, political actors, they, they do what they do. INEC is supposed to be the one to ensure good behavior. The, the rules of INEC are supposed to be so strict, no matter how crazy you are. Yeah. As a politician, you cannot act outside of those rules. So the, while people look at the political class and say, you shouldn't be behaving like this, there's also a massive school of thought that believes that, no, 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 you see, rules may not change the heart, but it can tame the heartless. And if these mm -hmm. rules are not being enforced properly is where we have a situation like this. So they basically put the blame on INEC. What do you what do you think? Is is it INEC it's, doing it's, the wrong thing here? No, it's easy, you know, to put the blame on INEC. And the reason why the politicians always divert attention to the Electoral Commission, it's because they know they have rendered the Electoral Commission powerless. How so? And there are several ways to do that. The first one we've all, we've talked about this several times that you need to deepen and strengthen the independence of the Electoral Commission. And the way to do so is to ensure that when you make appointments into INEC, they have to be persons of unquestionable integrity and persons who don't have partisan leanings. So Kayla, where... you and I are witnesses to the fact you're, you're, that recently... You're referring to this man... Recently. Uh, that has just been... Just recently. Yes. We saw how individuals were appointed as resident electoral it's, commissioners. It's, it's, who have, are you referring who to have, Mr. Etekama Umoren? Yeah, exactly. Because you, 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 you could see that in his videos, you know, he was adorning, you know, a party, um, party clothing. And you can clearly see that the partisanship of these people is unquestionable. But the fact that we are still a country where these same individuals were confirmed by the Senate. These same individuals are going to be superintending over a democratic activity that puts them in a position where they are umpires and they should be unbiased. But how do you have a biased election official, you know, managing a process and yet you expect that the other actors will have confidence in the Electoral Commission? No, because this same INEC is the INEC that politicians used to fear. This same electoral commission, politicians, these same politicians that we talk about, know that there was a time that they will not engage, they will not violate provisions of the law because they know that INEC would activate its regulatory power. But then, even though INEC cancelled elections in these by-elections, but you move from INEC and you go to the judiciary, because the judiciary has the power of judicial review, 
has the power of enforcing, you know, and interpreting our laws. But how do you explain situations where there's just inconsistencies in decisions being made? And you can clearly see from some of the judgments, it raises fundamental question about our own jurisprudence and, and whether the judiciary, you know, is a temple of electoral justice. Now, there are some judges in the courts and in the way that they have ruled are individuals who we know for sure, you know, have unquestionable integrity. But just check, even in the last ruling issued by the Supreme Court on Plato and Kano, and listen to what their lordship said in chiding some of the judges in the court of appeal. In the lower so court something court. is fundamentally wrong what, about what, how we perceive it. And on? so politicians know that if INEC asserts its independence, it will put them in check. Therefore, they have to weaken the Electoral Commission and make it incapable of holding them to account. Or even when INEC wields the big, big stick, they go to the court to procure all sorts of injunction and judgments just to escape accountability. And you cannot have a democratic system where politicians don't want to be held to account, where politicians don't want to play the game by the rules. And I say it is not all politicians, but there are people and parties who we know are very notorious for doing what? For violating provisions of, of our law. And this is unacceptable. And Nigerians should not tolerate it. And this is where voters also have a role to play. Voters are witnesses, and they experience some of these infractions, some of these bad behavior on the part of political parties. Why is it that voters have failed to reward bad behavior, you know, by not voting for parties and candidates who we know do not have respect for the rule of law? Because if a party gets into power, you know, through extra, what, judicial means or without following the rules, there is no way they are going to govern based on the dictates of the law. They will not have respect for the rule of law. This is why we need to get Nigerians more aware, more conscious of the fact that any political party that does not respect the rule of the law, any political party that does not comply with provisions of INEC guidelines and our electoral act, do not reward them by voting for them on the day of elections. We should punish those parties so they also learn that voters have become more conscious and that when parties derail, when they don't respect our laws, then we don't expect them to respect us when they get into office. It's a vicious circle, and all these things are connected. When voters sell their votes to political parties, knowing well that political parties are actually doing what? Committing an offense by buying votes. When voters vote for political parties who illegally substitute candidates, when voters vote for political parties who try to compromise INEC officials by getting them to prefer result sheets before accreditation and voting. What you're simply doing, you are endorsing this bad behavior, you're endorsing this illegality, and so don't expect that when they get into office, they will be accountable to you. Because what goes around comes around. And this is where agency on the part of citizens is critical if we're going to reverse this culture of electoral impunity that seems to have, you know, been institutionalized within our electoral process. It does feel like there's the problem is from everywhere. If you look at it from the side of citizens mm. being able to stand up and say, we cannot do this, oh, there's a the part where they give you a little something. If you say you don't want to take something, ah, the economy is biting hard on you. Other people will take, and yeah. you are one person. And then there's the part where... <sighs> the political actors themselves just decide not to play by the rules. Then you mentioned right now the judiciary bit of it. It feels like everywhere there's always a way for, for people to break the rules everywhere. But central to everything that you just mentioned are the rules. Yeah. How, so you talked about how INEC is, they're trying to make sure it's not as strong you know, the, the politicians don't want to be afraid of INEC. So they, how can that be fixed? We're seeing, of course, you mentioned uh, Etekamba, uh, Umoren's, you know, appointment yes. as a resident electoral commissioner. I want you to, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a bit, but is there a way out? Is there a solution to the problem? Because you just mentioned agency on the part of citizens. <laughs> that would be knocked 
by the fact that citizens uh, need money. Mm. And politicians know this. Well, okay. You've mentioned all the problems. How, how, how can it well, be sorted? Quite frankly, I, 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 or agree, is there no I agree that the social conditions of people needs to be improved. And people are compromising values because of the state of the economy and the economic hardships that they face, uh, what you call stomach infrastructure. I agree. But the big question citizens need to also reflect on is these pittances that you receive, is it for the short term or the long term? What would you it's rather for, it's prefer? For, it's for the short term. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and hopefully you... more short terms come. Ex <laughs> no, ma what, yes. What, as, long as, as long as it's... Because uh, elections, you and, we've covered elections but you around don't this country. Build, you don't build a country like that. You don't transform and change a country. So like how many that. people have this... bought into this idea of a transformed country? Well, have we been able to... Do you... We've covered I, I, elections around this country, me and you, Sam Kayla, said. I understand. You know how people are across I understand this country. That, that thought process. Are you sure it's not only us in Abuja a, we, we're in a very that are thinking like this? Situation. One, we are experiencing high levels of insecurity, no doubt. And if the constitution is clear that the purpose of government is the welfare and the security of citizens, if the whole concept of social contract is to the extent that the state has a responsibility to fulfill to citizens because citizens have vested in them certain powers and certain rights to take decisions on their behalf. And when they are not taking these decisions to advance public interest, rather some primordial and parochial interest, and not advancing the common good, there is a fundamental problem. But the solution to that isn't short-termism, isn't accepting, you know, these handouts that they give to you because it's not the solution. You need to think about long-term. You need to think about the future of your children because if you compromise today, these officials that you do buy, you know, your votes are not going to take decisions that represent you, that advance your interests. And that's the problem, that's the question, that, that's the, the fundamental discussion. The second bit about how we get out of this is the fact that people have gone to vote in the last election. Leaders have been elected into office. How many citizens are asking leaders the big question of how they are governing and how they are fulfilling their, their manifesto? How many citizens? So when you think about reforms, you need to think at, at, about this beyond elections because elections, democracy aren't about elections. It's time for governance. And so we need to ask the people who you've elected, not just the president. At your state level, you have governors who campaigned. You have state legislators. Let's say, okay, the local government system has been decimated in some states. But even if you ask the person who represents you in your state house of assembly, what are you doing to fix you know, the challenges of economy, to fix the challenges of what security and how you taking actions to hold the executive to account. You have to put the fire under their feet because the people who you've elected are your employees. But we, we're not asking these questions well enough. I'm not saying there are no questions. I love what's happening at the national level, but every time we focus on the, the National Assembly and the president, but we forget the governors in the state who owe it the responsibility and the duty to their people. So whilst you talk to the president, also to speak, you know, to your governor. The other point is about the role of political parties because we're discussing electoral reforms. And I dare say that when you look at our political parties and the party structure, to a large extent, there, there's no fundamental difference between these this parties. I think one thing is actually clear, that when you look at our political class, they are just driven by one ideology. And it's just what... We need to use party, political parties, as a vehicle for securing political power, even if we're not clear about what the power would seek to achieve. And that whole sense of the common good does not exist. Because if you look at decisions that leaders, political leaders have made, you ask yourself, and you look at the role also of the political parties, whether there is actually a divergence in terms of ideology and reasoning. And actually, you know, look at all the political parties.
And so citizens need to ask political parties fundamental questions. And one is a question about how do you recruit members of your parties? And then what role do members actually have in your political parties? Do you listen to members of your political parties? Do you have an updated party register? Before you develop your party program and your manifesto, do you consult with members of your political parties? In your candidate selection process, do the members of your political parties have a say? In some of the states, we saw how they manage their party primaries. It's not about the members of the party. It's about the oligarch. It's about the money bags. You know, to the extent that an individual in a party can rise and say, it's either his way or no other way. That is not how you build political parties. That's not because political parties are a platform for the aggregation of social interests. And so if citizens are active in political parties, they can shape, one, the programs of political parties. They can also shape the ideology of political parties. But what you currently have is just individuals who have hijacked you know, entire party structure and taking um, decisions. But then, if you move beyond political parties and, and, and role of citizens, you know, because we need to speak to citizens the same way we also speak about our elected leaders, is the fact that Martin Luther King said something, that our lives begin to end the day we become what's silent about the things that matter. Beyond the term which you vote at elections, the next thing and the next power you have as a citizen is your voice. We need to get citizens... And voice means so many things. It means asking questions. Asking questions. Insecurity is a fundamental problem across the country, not just the FCT. You can see the rates of kidnapping across the country. And the big question is to ask the institutions and the people who you have voted to do what? What are they doing to actually fix the insecurity? Are they bereft of ideas? Can you as a citizen provide alternative? But citizens also have a role to play also when you talk about security, about sharing information and intelligence. But doing so, they have to be confident that they will not become the victims. And now these are things that you need as, as a citizen and that consciousness needs to actually exist. But I think that when you look at the National Assembly and you look at the president, we also need to ask them questions. Um, and it's questions about, you know, how are you checking the excesses of the executive? How are they? And you see, the, yes, the National Assembly have instituted things like sectoral debates um, to get these leaders um, to answer questions about actions they are taking. Yes, very good, fantastic. But are the lawmakers reporting to their people on the decisions they are taking to address these issues, be it the economy? be it infrastructure, be it health, education, or even um, electoral reforms, but also institutions. Now, the National Assembly has commenced the whole process of, of, um, of electoral reforms. That's also an opportunity for citizens you know, to be involved in this process. But I think that if a citizen out there thinks just voting at elections last year is enough you know, to guarantee good governance, then I think you need to have a rethink. That good governance comes as a result of struggle. It comes as a result of debate. It comes as a result of consistent engagement. It comes as a result of using your voice to ask the right questions directed at the right institutions at the right time. Because if you keep quiet, don't think that politicians that we know and our political leaders are going to govern to advance your interests. No, they won't. You have to continually engage them and ask them those questions. And this is what civil society and media does by engaging these institutions and asking them the questions. The, the concept of good, good governance and, and national development involves a lot of collaborations. Mm. The, the education that is necessary for people to have the mindset that I, I'm not ashamed to say many of us have where we're trying to build our country, where we're trying to make things better have a country that our children can thrive in, not just live in or have to jack up from. It requires a lot of collaborations. Yeah. And there are many agencies, you know, that in, 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 in many parts of the country, 
people don't see the impact of those agencies, don't even know that these agencies are supposed to be a part of the process. When it comes to elections, INEC, the political class, the voter. But they're not the only people involved in this process, are they? They're security agencies. What other areas should come in, especially when it comes to education, you know, to let people know why they are doing what they're doing? Mm. I wouldn't sell my votes, neither would you. Several reasons, we're patriotic and we don't need your money. <laughs> but there are many people who do. How do we get those kinds of people to understand the dangers of selling their votes? You know, Kayla, uh, so let me, let me begin at a micro level. Because when we talk about these macro level issues, I don't think that people appreciate, you know, what it takes to conduct elections in, in Nigeria. And I'll just use three examples. And by the way, I believe strongly that I believe in this country. I, I, I won't be doing this if I don't believe that this country can change. Because we're not excited with the state of the country, but this is the only country that we have. And until, regardless of you know, how the country treats its people and its citizens, we as a people, need to rethink how we view our country. And I've seen Nigerians who love this country so much. And you see all this anger, whether it's on social media or anywhere. People are expressing anger because they love this country. Can, I, can, are... I, can I tell you a story? Yeah. There's a breaking story that mm -hmm. we're just looking at. Um, and Nigerians will see this. Mm. And it will, inf it will feel that same anger where people start saying online, this country is not working. Mm. There's no country. What are you talking about? The ex-minister of aviation, Hadi Sirika, mm. um, his brother has been arrested over an 8 billion naira aviation ministry probe. Now, apparently, uh, the immediate younger brother of the former minister of aviation um, w was arrested by the EFCC, apprehended by them uh, today over investigations of the aviation. He was, he was apprehended on the 4th, let me mm -hmm. beg your pardon, 4th of February. So uh, the minister was accused of conspiracy, abuse of office, diversion of public funds, contract inflation, criminal breach of trust, and money laundering, amounting to 8 billion naira. Now, the sum, the, the sum is for four aviation contracts from the former minister to a company uh, known as Engirios Nigeria Limited, owned by his younger brother. Mm -hmm. It's a long story. However, Nigerians will see this. Young people will see this. And remember when we were talking about Nigeria Air and, 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 and how yep. much, and these, these amounts of money that someone took. And this is what you found, by the way. You don't know what else is there. Yeah. That, stories like this, make Nigerians believe you're not talking to, you're, you're not talking to a child. Things but, aren't working. But also, if someone could do this but, in office, someone who... I didn't elect this person, by the way. This yeah. person was appointed into office by the president. Yep. If this can be happening, and it's not just a story, so many other stories. How do you want a Nigerian who's young to believe that things can work? But this is why, this is why Nigerians should learn from the Buhari administration. And I say this, you know, we had an eight years that was wasted, that you had a president that was not present, who was not, and you could see from the books, from all the conversations, it's even an insult to Nigerians who voted for him and Nigeria as a country that you had a president that was absent. And so he appointed people and he wasn't holding them to do what? He wasn't holding them to account. Now, we shouldn't, and we should learn from this, that next time we have an opportunity, we must elect people, public leaders who will know will take responsibility, right, for the actions and the positions that they hold because they hold power in trust for people. So that's something to learn. But then, if you listen to this story, it also tells you something, that our institutions may not be functioning optimally, but they are working. And that's why this investigation because someone and an institution is handling this probe. Now, if they were not, you know, committed 
to the Nigeria project, perhaps they wouldn't have exposed this. There may be other political considerations, but that's not my business. But as far as I'm concerned, the fact that someone who was in position of trust abused office and did this, right? And the institution can investigate and expose this tells me that the institutions can work. It's the same thing we talk about security agencies. We've seen elections where the police and other security agencies insisted on doing the right thing and the politicians were kept at bay. They didn't undermine the process. Just recently, in recent elections. So it tells you that there's something that our institutions can do what? They can work. They can function if and only if we have individuals who are what? Who have integrity and who are committed to the project. And to the point, you know, to back to the question you made, you asked about, you know, in terms of vote buying and this. One, INEC, one of the things that Nigerians should celebrate about the last election was the fact that for the first time in our history, we printed ballot papers and result sheets in Nigeria. For the first time. And this same INEC took that decision to address issues around logistics. Now, did it eventually address the question of um, logistical challenges? No, there were other issues. But ballot papers and result sheets were printed in Nigeria. Nigerian companies managed what? That printing here in Nigeria. Nigeria companies owned by Nigerians. Now, in that situation, if you have a Nigerian who owns a company who does not have integrity and decides to do what? To print ballot papers of lower quality and resource sheets of lower quality, it's an unpatriotic act. So you need Nigerians at that level to say, hey, I've had the opportunity to print ballot papers for a general election. Because I love this country, and I'm a patriotic Nigerian, I will not compromise standard. I will give this country the best. You're not giving INEC the best. You're giving Nigeria what? The best. That is a domain of expressing patriotism in the whole electoral manage, um, election management value chain. The second, who manages our elections? It's Nigerians. Core members, students, lecturers, it's Nigerians that manage our elections. We don't have foreigners who administer our elections. And so when we say that election boils down to the personal integrity of those who are managing the elections, it's, it's a serious issue. So if a presiding officer who is somewhere in your local government and in your village will start to come and administer the election and insist on doing the right thing and not compromising standard, then the election in that particular polling unit is what? will be credible. Or if that, po po that presiding officer decides that in their polling unit, nobody will buy votes, right? It's exercising agency. But if you have a situation where a Nigerian, like we saw, and I disappointingly, you know, a core member who was caught with over a million naira in the last governorship election, even though we don't know what's happened to those people, right? Clearly tells you that Sometimes it's also about we, Nigerians, and what we do. And yes, the political class is the political class, but we cannot replicate the same behavior that we see on the part of politicians and also yield you know, to this compromise. Because the reason why they compromise the process is because, one, they know under a fair and a credible process, there is no way they will win an election. So they want to subvert the process. Two, they want to force themselves on Nigerians and people. And three, they see public office as an opportunity for primitive accumulation of wealth. And because some of them don't have an alternate address, they want to live and die in public office. And so when you think about reforms, every institution has a critical role to play. It's not just INEC, it's not just security agencies or the judiciary, including business entities. For when you say transportation of election materials, is it not the NURTW and Ratien and all the other transport companies? Those transport companies are what? Owned by Nigerians. The drivers are Nigerians, right? The associations are led by Nigerians. 
But if they conspire with politicians and make it difficult for INEC to deploy, or like cases where we've seen internal sabotage, you're also questioning that why do we always focus on one institution and not look at how are the other components also functioning to undermine the credibility of our electoral process, including our academic institutions. I, I want to I go to something that happens before every single election, which is the signing of a peace accord. Peace accords were signed in mm -hmm. Abaibom, in Kano, and in Enugu State. What happens when a peace accord is breached? Are there punitive measures? Can, they, who can, can people be held accountable? It, 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 it does feel like sometimes they sign this accord and then everybody just hopes for the best. And when situations like we saw in Kano, Akwai bomb and Enugu happen, and Ekwo postponed the election. But who's who's been, you know, who's been punished for this? You know, I pray that we get to a point in our democratic expedition where we don't need to sign peace accord. There's a reason why we sign peace accord. It's to commit political actors, you know, to peaceful, transparent conduct. In the but they of breached the accord now in Kano, Akwaibo, I'm saying and Enugu State. Those I'm that saying, breached it in those states, we need can to get to a point mm. where we don't need to sign peace accord. And the only way we can do that is one, you need a political class that have respect for democratic values. It's important because some of these interventions is trying to cure a symptom. But and not, the, not disease. the disease. And the disease is this attitude of, you know, some politicians and a political class towards political power. So they need to reset, you know, their mindset. We need to get to that point. But your question about accountability for that, I think there's a moral accountability bit. There's no legal sort of accountability. But then, there are laws in our Electoral Act, there are laws in our penal code. There are laws in our criminal code. If a politician and a party breached, breaches that, why do you need to enforce a peace accord? Why won't the state enforce the law? Already existing laws. Why won't, look at what happened in the, by, um, the weekend's elections in Kano or even in Enugu. Did the security agencies arrest those people? Or like you saw in a place like Kano, which is just unbelievable, the amount of thugs that were deployed by politicians, you know, to disrupt elections. And in some cases, perhaps they even overwhelm the security agencies. Because if you see the number of thugs in, in Kunchin local, um, um, local government, someone needs to be held to account. Because if you don't hold them to account, there are provisions in our laws. Why are local elections always so dangerous? Uh, it's, it's more dangerous to do local elections, states, local, than federal. Well, why, why is this the case? I don't think it's... Well, it depends on what you mean by local elections. Because off-cycle elections, or because a by-election is, an off, to a large extent, an off-cycle off election, yes. um, depending on the actors and the competitive nature of those elections, um, there is bound to be those forms of violence, especially the context. Kano was not the only state that elections held. It held in about 26 states. Why was Kano, Akwaibom, Enugu different? Because of the parties involved. Because of the, part, because of the local politics. Because all politics is what is local. But in the other states, there weren't, you know, um, widespread cases of, of violence. And so it's just the, the local politics in that you know, place the, the violence that, that makes comes it with, difficult. The violence that comes with local politics in many ways stops people from participating at the local level. Absolutely, it does. And, and Which is so. why you mentioned, even before the elections, you had complained that there, there was going to be voter apathy. Yeah. And we saw that play out. Yeah. I'm not coming outside when there are thugs. Absolutely. And this is why assurances from security agencies is critical. And this is the more reason why our security agencies need to arrest and prosecute these people. And in the last one year, yes, they have been arrested in the last general elections. They were arrested in the off-cycle elections. The big question is what is the status of the prosecution of these people? If you don't use them as examples, you're not going to deter future 
um, sort of um, violence uh, um, on the part of our political class. So we need, we need to see prosecution of these individuals and particularly those who disrupt public peace. I want to take, against you, our laws. I want to take you to this topic which a lot of civil society organizations have been upset about before it started and that is the, um, the resident electoral commissioner now. Mm. Uh, it wasn't just him at the time. Uh, there were other people that civil society had raised questions about. But Etekamba Umoren, uh, who was allegedly a known member and loyalist of the ruling All Progressives Congress, has been made a resident electoral commissioner. And, of course, uh, this is despite all of the uproar from civil society yourself included. So what next? Was it that they didn't listen or did they know something that you all didn't know? And what next? Well, I think it's just the fact that they completely ignore the voices of, of people. Um, Did they give any reason? That's simply... Did that's, they give any reason why they had to... Absolutely no. You, if you watch the proceedings um, at, at the Senate, you, you, just, you just see this insidious you know, capture of our electoral institutions. And when several years and several months ago, civil society... You know, when we released the Election Manipulation Risk Index, we did say there is a desperation to capture the institution of INEC. We mentioned this, that once you capture the institution, you make it powerless. It's unable to do what? To manage elections in a way that it inspires public confidence. There's a reason why in our constitution, in our constitution, there is a criteria for non-partisanship and persons of unquestionable integrity. It was clearly stated in our constitution. But how do you explain a situation where you have individuals who publicly campaigned for political parties, not just publicly campaigned for political parties, even wore the apparel you know, of those political parties, it's there in the public domain. So what happens and now? And these same individuals are now going to be arrested, are now Resident now electoral resident. commissioner. So what happens? How do you expect to inspire what happens? confidence? Are you, is, are you going to, is civil society just well, going to let you know, it go? Well, you know, a section of civil society have instituted a matter um, in, in court. Okay. That pr process is, is on. I think that we, we would not keep quiet on this particular issue because the advocacy for, on this issue is to defend the Constitution. And that is the role that we have. Not just as civil society, but as citizens. We have a fundamental duty to protect our constitution. We have a fundamental duty to protect the institution of INEC. Because if that institution is not protected and its independence is not guaranteed, there is no way our dream of an election that reflects the will of the people will be conducted. And I've said this repeatedly, you cannot have an electoral commission you know, that conducts elections that does not inspire confidence on the part of the people. And Nigerians need to speak. It's not a struggle for civil society. It's a struggle for Nigeria because this is about Nigeria, to protect INEC. INEC is an institution of Nigeria. And so because it's an institution of Nigeria, and the Constitution says these are the only caliber, the category of persons, and you have a cross-section of our society and our political class who said no, we want to capture this institution, and so we're going to in, ensure loyalists go into that institution. So you think that's what this and is when exact, it comes to Mr. Of course, how else, do, how else do you this explain This is one it? of the but then, machineries to capture INEC. Is there are remedial actions. It's clear. That's, that's just it. And it's, it's a no-brainer, honestly, because that's what they want to do. But we as citizens have a role to play. And especially if these individuals, because when they're appointed, that's why justice weighs. In his wisdom and that of members of his committee, recommended that you should, we as a country, should rethink the appointment process of national commissioners and resident electoral commissioners, including the INEC chairman. That the current practice is what makes it possible to have people who are party loyalists, you know, as commissioners um, of INEC. So we need to rethink that. And so when we think about reforms, and this is where, you know, President Tinubu has a fundamental role to play. Because I know, years ago, this current president also supported the electoral reform process post 
the Justice Ways Committee's era, where he set up CODA, the Coalition for Democrat for Electoral Reforms, and he had public events. I was the participant in those, in those events. Some were held in several places across the country. I was a participant. And I know that one of the key recommendations and advocacy points that CODA advanced was on the need to strengthen the independence of INEC, remove the appointive powers from you know, the president. Now that President Tenobu is the president, he has an opportunity to implement some of those fantastic ideas that was espoused during you know, um, Koda's um, existence, and I know they still exist now. One of them is how do you strengthen the independence of INEC? So he needs to publicly demonstrate to Nigerians that he's committed to reforms, and reforms actually start by this whole discourse about how do we strengthen the independence of INEC. He's also going to make appointments into the Electoral Commission. This last appointment that he's made for X, it will be huge public outcry. And so, to a large extent, he has an opportunity to redeem and also do what? Inspire confidence that he would handle the appointment process of INEC commissioners differently. And there are several ways he can do that. Whether the constitution is amended or not, there are several ways the president can actually open up the process and make the process more more participatory, but also subjected to public scrutiny. I want to, we don't have much time left, but before you go, I wanted us to be able to talk about Nigerians and their faith in the electoral process. We, of course, heard the IREV situation. <laughs> so many people are still a little, you know, confused about that. Is it a prerequisite for, for our electoral process or is it not? Is it something that we hope to use? If it doesn't work out, we let it go. So many, many Nigerians still don't quite understand how that works. But, and that also leads to belief in the credibility. We started off this program by asking, is INEC worth its salt? What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? I think that public trust in the electoral process has declined. And it's for the right reasons. And what I mean is, the entire electoral process and how it was managed from the general elections till date leaves so much to be de desired. Nigerians no longer trust the electoral process. The trust for INEC has, what, has declined drastically. But the big question is how do we rebuild public trust in the electoral process? Because there will be elections. In fact, the, 2020, trust the, process or the, not, 2027, there will be elections. the 2027 elections is about 1,129 or 30 days from today. The 2027 elections. So there will still be elections. But INEC has a role to play in inspiring confidence on the part of Nigerians. And three things. One, I agree that the commission needs to explain to Nigerians what happened with the IRF. Regardless of the IRF's role and its position in the Electoral Act or based on the interpretation of the courts, Nigerians need to know what happened beyond the statement of a technical glitch. And I see an opportunity for INEC. So INEC is yet to release its 20, 2023 election report. They've also, they are yet to release the review of the elections our expectation is that when INEC releases those reports, it would explain, provide more information as to what happened to what to the IRF. The second is the prosecution of INEC officials that subverted the 2023 elections, including the off-cycle elections. There were compromised INEC officials who undermined the process. In fact, INEC statements confirmed this. Nigerians want to know what happened to those INEC officials, whether ad hoc or permanent, who internally sabotaged the electoral process, including those who sabotaged the logistics deployment. Because if INEC does not take remedial actions, if it doesn't sanction its own staff and those who compromise the process, there is no way they're going to inspire confidence on the part of Nigerians. The third 
critical action around inspiring confidence on Nigerians is the whole agenda for electoral reforms and how the commission and other stakeholders build consensus on critical issues around reforms is critical to how you build public confidence because there will be elections and staying away from the voting units and polling units it's not going to solve the problem instead it will worsen it because the more you don't show up to vote just know someone is voting for you or bad leaders are going to emerge but people need to show up but they need to be they need to show up confident that their votes will count and it begins by using your voice to demand the right set of reforms that we'd require in this electoral process. And I've just highlighted those. That please, Nigerians should know that there is a section of our political class that don't want electoral technology. We shouldn't forget how Nigerians struggle to get the electoral act that we get, that we got. Politicians, some politicians, and I say it, let me qualify that, do not like the beavers because of the role the beavers played in the last election. The beavers has come to stay. Electronic accreditation has come to stay. It, it, it deepens the integrity of the process. Let's be vigilant that politicians don't do what? Get the country to a point where it abandons electronic accreditation. Electronic transmission of results should also be integrated in what? In the electoral legal framework, just like the Supreme Court have advised it's important that it is clear, this ambiguity around transmission of resource and resource management also needs to, what needs to be addressed. The other point is about the conclusion of all election matters before swearing in. So there is need to revise the time frame, you know, so that elections are what, election petitions and the electoral dispute are resolved before swearing um, in. The other issue, a fundamental issue for reform, is this appointment process of INEC chairman, INEC commissioners, that that process also needs to be reviewed in a way that it subjects the process to public scrutiny. People want to know, and they have a right to know. And if we are a constitutional democracy, and a constitutional democracy vested or based on the popular choice and the will of the people, then the people need to be at the center of this. And it's not the preference of our political class that should have the day. It should be the preferences of the Nigerian people for whom this country and our constitution has secured their rights to participating in public affairs and not allow political class hijack the whole machinery of governance and then keep the people out. No, that's not what democracy is about. Democracy is about the people. They have to be part of it. And so don't wait as a citizens to be engaged. Demand it because the constitution is very clear that sovereignty lies with the people of Nigeria. Therefore, our electoral reform, our electoral process must seek to advance the interests of the people and must reflect the will and the aspirations of the Nigerian people, not the will and aspirations of a section of our political class. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Samson Itodo, for being with us on Political Paradigm. Always I, a delight. Thank I, you. I know that you are leading the conversation right now on engaging um, the electoral process before the elections. Uh, party verifications have been, go uh, have been going on mm -hmm. uh, by INEC right now to make sure that these parties are healthy enough <laughs> to contest yeah. in the elections in the first place. And I know that a lot of advocacy is going on, but j just in a few seconds, you know, uh, how, should, how should we be looking as, as we get ready for the elections in Edo State? We have a lot of, of cycle elections before 2027. 20, how, how should we be engaging that process right now? I think it's to continue to demand that, you know, the National Assembly accelerates the reform process. Um, it's to also continue to place the demand on political parties to respect the laws, but also get INEC to activate its regulatory powers mm -hmm. as provided in the Electoral Act. Because what we're currently observing with the Congress is conducted by some of the parties in those states where you have off-cycle elections is one that clearly tells us our political class are not prepared or determined to play this game by its rules. Well, thank you again for thank being you. with us.
And uh, good luck <laughs> with Thank all you. the work you have ahead of you. The work we have. <laughs> with work we have ahead of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have been speaking with the, Mr. Samson Itodo, Executive Director of Yaga Africa and convener of the Not Too Young to Run movement. Please join the conversation on channelcv.com. Leave your comments, respectfully, of course. And let's keep asking until the accountability question is answered. Thank you so much for watching. I am Kayla Magua. See you next time.